good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here. Of course, you do realize we lost about an hour of sleep last night with the daylight savings condition. But I'm glad you folks are here and alert uh, and ready to go. How did you win not alert? Of course, before the advent of smartphones and portable devices that automatically uh, you know, shift our time for us, typically this would be the service we would have people wandering in uh, about 11 o'clock just in time for coffee hour. <laughs> Which always worked out fine. If we're late to congregate, we're So it's nice to see everyone here. For a prelude this morning, we have a classical piece. Uh, this is Concerto in E, Largo from Vivaldi's Four Seasons, and performed by Nigel Kennedy and the English Chamber Orchestra. So for our center in this morning, let us release what we have brought here uh, and contemplate during this piece of Vivaldi on this March Sunday. traditions to increase one's mental stability and emotional balance. This inner resource is available anytime we take a break from our automatic thinking and intentionally note our conscious awareness. By simply shifting our attention to the mind, observing the what's happening in the here and now, we immediately arrive in the here. So for our moment of centering silence, let us relax into this instant. Nothing before, nothing after, just this. Experience what is right here, 
relax the self-contraction of your own mental activity, and just enter the expansive space of simple awareness. <coughs> Sit and hear the sound of the chime. done this before. I will guide you through it. So the long match is going to transfer the flame from the candle to the chalice. Chalice lighting this morning is from the UUA book, Seven Principles in Word and Worship. We light our flaming chalice to illuminate the world we seek. In the search for truth, may we be just. In the search for justice, may we be loving. And in loving, may we find ourselves great peace. Well, today is the fourth Sunday of Lent. Uh, this is the season of transition in nature, a time of melting snow and water movement, absorption, mud. <laughs> so Lent comes at a good time in New England as nature serves as a spiritual metaphor for change, shift, contemplative reflection or rethinking, and a gradual transition uh, to what's coming next. You'll notice a Wendell Berry quote in today's bulletin uh, about this shared uh, eco-home planet, the ground, sky, and earth itself. So I found a quote uh, by Wendell Berry where he talks about slowly we return to Earth. Through the weeks of deep snow, we have walked above the ground on fallen sky. As though we did not come of root or leaf, as though we only had air and weather for our difficult home. But now, as March warms and the rivulets water run like bird song on the slopes, and the branches of light sing in the hills, slowly we return to earth. Let us sing this morning, number 361. Enter, rejoice, and come in. We're going to do all verses. Uh, there's two small ones at the bottom of the page, number four and five. And let us stand as you are able.
want to add a crater, uh, since this is Lent. Uh, this is a variation of the Lord's Prayer adapted by Jacob Trapp. O thou whose kingdom is within, may all thy names be hallowed. May no one of them be turned against others to, to divide those who address thee. May thy presence be made known to us in mercy, beauty, love, and justice. May thy kingdom come to be in the life of all humankind. May it come with peace, with sharing, and in a near time. Give us this day our daily bread, free from all envy and alienation, broken and blessed in the sharing. Keep us from trespass against others and from the feeling that others are trespassing against us. Forgive us more than we have forgiven and deliver us from being tempted by lesser things to be heedless of the great one thing, the gift of the divine in us. Amen. Okay, let's do our reading together. Number 434, we're back in a great book. Hey, we're going to read this in unison this morning. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of the humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle to the universe. This is this morning. The Pishka is on the piano, collection for local needs in our community and in our congregation. Uh, Billy Fungiro is on the piano. Uh, we're going to circulate the plate in a minute. Joshua, do take that job on for us today. Uh, and today's operatory is by Herb Elf from the Tijuana Brass, one of my favorite Groups. You can always find one of their vinyl records for a dollar in the discount bins in most of the department stores back in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, of course, now it's all right on uh, Spotify or Apple Music. So this is more and more a more. <coughs> We give the parts of plants.
favorite philosophers would be stand-up comedian Stephen Wright from back in the 80s, 90s. Now, he's been around for 40 plus years now. Uh, if you remember his deadpan delivery uh, and his stage presence. Uh, so, a couple of quotes to start off our topic this morning on tipping points. <clears throat> when everything is coming your way, be careful. You might be in the wrong lane. <laughs> or if at first you don't succeed, destroy all evidence that you tried. And if at first you don't succeed, then skydiving definitely isn't for you. <laughs> and one more. Everywhere is walking distance if you have the time. <laughs> So we are in part seven of this topic on earth care. Uh, so again, this has been a long and uh, varied uh, topics that we've been cover, covering. Uh, so we're just trying to make progress one service at a time, this being uh, part seven. So last Saturday afternoon, I walked out of the house with no hat on and started walking back across the open field. Uh, no snow cover, uh, mo modest temperatures in the 40, 40s, and uh, I wanted to walk down to the cabin uh, to check on the winter ice in the cabin. Never had to shovel off the roof this winter for winter maintenance. Uh, and during the walk, it just felt so odd, oddly disorienting to, I had to keep telling myself that this was the first week of March instead of uh, the first weekend of April, is when normally that would be the sense from this walk. As we got closer to the cabin, the river's on the right, and I could hear water running through the woods. And I knew at that point uh, the ice uh, was already out on the north branch of the Cave. It had already left downtown Holton a uh, few days before. Uh, and driving into Holton all this week, it's just been this um, off kilter sense of open water this time of year. Years ago, uh, March would be the month we would select to go into Mount Katahdin for a backwoods expedition uh, in hopes of summiting Mount Katahdin. And we did this trip uh, for 20, 20 plus years. And over the years, we had always, in March, the first full moon in March is when we would try to book our trip uh, which would, temperatures were slightly milder than the brutal temperatures you could sometimes incur in January and February. Slightly longer day, uh, and maximum snow collection up at Chimney Pond uh, and around the Great Basin. So this year, friends of mine went in a couple of weeks ago, and they brought back this pair of pants that I'm wearing today. No one in the group had ordered these backcountry expedition pants. Uh, it didn't fit the person who ordered it. And they went through all the guys uh, on the expedition team. N none of them could wear these pants. Uh, and they passed, knowing I had a background, uh, they gave them to Linda, brought these home. And they fit perfectly. <laughs> uh, this is the high end, the Cadillac of backwood ski mountaineering pants. Uh, here's all zippers. Uh, I'll model these at yeah, your service if you like. You can hear me walking around with these ski pants, sneaky sound. But I knew today was the only day this year I would probably get to wear these brand new pants, uh, even though uh, the temperature's in the 40s this week. 50s earlier in the week. Joshua also got a pair of pants similar to these 
Uh, did you wear them today, Joshua? I did. Okay. Uh, again, what? Joshua got the Martin's price. Uh, but mine were still cheaper, Joshua. Uh, so this is the Mammoth brand. This is Swiss made high end expedition gear wear. Uh, I'm not sure how much I'm going to get a chance to wear these this winter or, or next winter. So that's why I've got, I've got them on. Thank you, Joshua, for, for wearing your pair today also. <laughs> As a global community, we are faced with multiple and concurrent challenges that require an informed and coordinated response if we are successfully to successfully navigate our way into a livable future. And sometimes it feels like a tipsy balancing act. Planetary boundaries are key processes essential for sustaining life on Earth. Each one has a limit as to how much pressure it can take from humanity before it is pushed over a tipping point and into a state in which changes can no longer or very difficult to reverse. So in our last session, uh, we brought Stretch Out Sam of his 1990s game uh, as part of the balancing act and the kids were great getting through these. We just selected six points of challenge uh, or tipping points. And those six were, the first two were the, the contributions to the issue. Essentially increasing levels of CO2, uh, driving up temperatures. Two, the deforestation, uh, which is contributing to uh, the factors uh, along with raising the temperatures. And then the next four were what we listed some of the effects from higher CO2 and deforestation. Uh, number three was rising sea levels, uh, polar and Antarctic polar melting. Four, acidification of oceans uh, affecting coral reefs, ocean currents. Five, loss of biodiversity. And six, loss of stable temperature or Temperature fluctuation and variability uh, affecting permafrost type of a domino factor. And I remember going to a lecture years ago at Common Ground Country Fair with the weatherman was there from, from National Public Radio, Lou McNally. And he was also a uh, doctorate in climate science. And this was ten, probably 10 years ago. And in his lecture, he was a, noticing and the changing zones, growing zones, and he said, the word that you're going to be hearing, and he said this 10 years ago, the word for weather is variability of opposite extremes, stretches, short stretches, intense, wild fluctuation. Uh, and over that time, every time I see this word, variability, come up, and it really is so uh, on target. Uh, that is addressing so many of these other linked tipping point uh, issues. So in the bulletin, you'll see a little chart that has a few more specifics. Uh, they point out uh, A through J of <coughs> tipping points on the planet. And you can see how some of those tie directly into these six that uh, Stretch Out Sam was talking about. Uh, In the game we played a couple of weeks ago, uh, every little motion, you know, I, I watched the YouTube video and you could see the plates, you know, moving, moving around sometimes on the tray. Uh, so the term we're seeing is inter intersectionality, uh, the term that keeps coming up, of these overlapping impacts or how interconnected that the whole universe is. Uh, one of our poetry readings last week was on weaving, the Chief Seattle quote, of weaving fabric in these intersectional systems. So I'm briefly going to read, this is an article that came out of the New York Times last week by John Valiant. Uh, he's an author, 
based out of Colorado and Texas, and he wrote a book last year titled Fire Weather, A True Story from a Hotter World. And he was in Texas writing this story while the wildfires were going on uh, during the last two weeks. It's alarming to see these fires and warnings in what is supposed to be the dead of winter. But fire, as distracting and dangerous as it is, is merely one symptom. What is happening in North America is not a regional aberration. It's part of a global departure, what climate scientists call a phase shift. The past year has seen virtually every metric of planetary distress lurch into uncharted territory. Sea surface, temperature, air temperature, polar ice loss, fire intensity. You name it, it's off the charts. It was 72 degrees Fahrenheit in Wisconsin on Tuesday, and 110 degrees Fahrenheit in Paraguay. Large portions of North Pacific and the South Atlantic are running more than five degrees Fahrenheit above normal this winter. Thomas Smith, an environmental geographer at the London School of Economics, summed it up this way, this is in the BBC last summer. I'm not aware of a similar period when all parts of the climate system were in record-breaking or abnormal territory. That was last summer. If I learned one thing from writing about these wildfires, it's that this hotter, less stable world is not the new normal. We are entering clima incognita. <laughs> the unknown climate. Here there be dragons, and some of them are fires 20 miles wide. So last week, our newly formed Aroostook Climate Group, the Central Chapter in Presque Isle, and the South Chapter here in Holton, we met. And we had a small agenda, but most of our time was consisted of talking about the weather and the winter. Uh, Can-Am dog racing was before Can, so the short ski season, the short ski season. Uh, and Mark Horvath uh, is a member of our group. He's delivering a lecture uh, during the eclipse on Sunday afternoon, April 7th, and the title of his talk is Fire and Ice, Climates Across the Solar System. And in this lecture, uh, he's looking at these tipping points on other planets in the solar system that did occur. Uh, so initial, the initial part of the lecture is uh, planetary, uh, drawing in eclipse goers uh, to, to the lecture and the talk. Uh, but he's steering it quickly into the climate-related issues of other planets in the solar system, the changes they've gone through, uh, and also our challenge to maintain our eco-ball as uh, sustainable. All the systems in sync. <coughs> Years ago I had what, what I call the Oreo cookie model of global shift related to us here in Holton, Maine. And I use the Oreo cookie, the chocolate bottom, like along the equator, increasing temperatures. The cream, creamy filling in the middle would be the snow strip or snow pack. Uh, and the cookie on top would be uh, zones in the Arctic or, or the Antarctic. And as the two layers, the two cookie layers are going to be affected dramatically the first, with much of the radiation. And, but eventually, it's going to affect that middle zone that's going to hang on about the longest of traditional weather patterns or snowfall. And, and sure enough, watching this play out the last 30 years, that narrow strip runs right through Holton Bay, all on the Canadian-US border, uh, out west to, to the Rockies, as one of the last places seeing the gradual effects or seeing those effects last. And that's held true. Uh, this year, we're seeing you know, 
that vanilla feeling just continuing to shrink. Where our winter year, uh, I skied for four weeks uh, uh, to the cabin back and forth between open, open fields. Uh, I've never seen that in, in my lifetime. Uh, first, week of, first week of March. I want to mention just a few resources this morning of films or documentaries uh, that are focused on tipping points for some of these challenges. The classic, as it's become in the last 25 years, is Inconvenient Truth uh, with Al Gore in 2006. And at the time, uh, we showed it downstairs. It was the first viewing in Aroostook County. Temple Center, even, even the cinemas had not been released, uh, didn't have access to the film before a certain organization you could register ahead of time. And we were one of the organizations that did a pre, pre viewing uh, screening of the film. We didn't have a, a wide enough screen. We hung a sheet downstairs in the basement and we filled the basement of people wanting to watch that uh, really groundbreaking uh, film at the time. And that's been 20 plus years ago. A lot of these same conversations, it's like this walking trip, you know, of how much time do you have to pursue these conversations. That's a tipping point. <laughs> if you're getting into it, Sam's hanging in there. Uh, I'm thinking of there's several David Attenborough films on BBC. There's a new one just released on, on Netflix that came out this winter. And that's titled Breaking Boundaries, the Science of Our Planet. Uh, which might be one to add to our resource list. Planetary from 2015 is one we show some footage from here in the earlier service. Uh, Don't Look Up that came out last year uh, was a uh, one film. And the Planet Earth series several years back uh, just showed the gorgeous, it's like a National Geographic approach to the delicate nature of our planet. We're going to take a little time right here uh, to have a short conversation of anything that may have come up regarding uh, these specific issues, tipping points, comments on the weather, uh, or again, one of these resources, uh, a film or a book, especially. So the floor is open, and we'll have a, a brief conversation here. Um, not being from Maine, I don't have a lot of uh, the context like you do with with climate change, and I've lived all over the place my whole life, so there's no consistency with me being able to tell um, what's happening to the planet um, outside of what people are telling me. And and the way I see it, and the evidence is there. I, you tell me, I look at the evidence, it's real. So um, what I'm seeing, is is a lot of um, is so big that the individual myself I feel like I can't do anything to help therefore I ignore it and I think that that is our current why why we've been talking about it in the same way for 20 years um, that it's hard to figure out what we do to have any type of improvement. You know, like video games, you play the game, you level up. Well, in real life, there's not that structure. We just have economy and government. So, um, is there any, I know that the book has a lot of independent, individualized climate change stuff, but is there anything we can do here um, that can help in small ways? Um, so for, for me, uh, I don't compost. Um, 
because I live in town and I'm a garden. There's like a lot of the little things I think I can learn and pick up. But my general impression is that this is such a big topic that it's really hard not to be ignorant on it. Like the amount of information that this encompasses and, and its, its potential for influencing us uh, back because this is the this is the garden we created, you know. Um, it's a bit intimidating. I've heard that the younger gen generation is a lot more attached to fixing climate change than my generation. Like my kids are going to be a, a lot more uh, warrior proactive about fixing it than my generation is. Is there any information on that or a way forward? Oh, that's a big big question. That's something we're trying to pull out of this, this, this study topic this year. Mm -hmm. In the end, are, uh, what are some small things we can do here in Holton yeah. as individuals and as groups? And you know, that's becoming clear. It's like to organize where even small groups of 20 people have uh, an effect uh, that they can have on, on an area or in the state of Maine, you know, directly knowing our, our U.S. You know, senators and representatives. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the assignment for the work. And these two new groups, you know, the, the Aroostook Climate Group, and the formation with that in mind. What can we do uh, for projects in, in Holton? A lot of it is educational, getting the information out. And then what can we do? Uh, I mean, even small steps or small projects uh, do accumulate. So really have to address the larger core issues or models of the economy. Are going to have to come into play. Uh, Dale first, and then Christoph. I'm just thinking of my emotional response over the years. I grew up in Massachusetts for 10 years, and we had a ton of snow by Christmas in Massachusetts, even before Thanksgiving. And I love being um, just blanketed in. You know, you open your door, and the snow's that high, and you know. Your house is warmer because of the insulation of the snow. And um, this year, it's like I'm mourning the loss of that. And along with that is the information from the ice caps, polar, you know, our wonderful polar bears and species that might go extinct, plus all the bugs we're having that we you never know, used to have to, never used to have to think about ticks and danger of ticks or anything like that. So things are changing. And for an old person who doesn't like change, um, I know everybody says, oh, it was such a nice, easy winter. Well, yes, but at what cost for our planet? So that's something I'm going through personally. It's sort of always there, that kind of sadness. I was talking with Bill White one day about it, and he said, but look at all we can enjoy about the planet. It's a lot still beautiful, you know, focus on the positives instead of the negatives. So, that's what, I, that's what I have to do. Uh, Christoph, you, you have something to um, and then we'll hit. My, my perception is my reality, and uh, I think climate change is real. Um, but I think it's also, there's so many arguments that people throw back and forth. There's political places, there's all sorts of things, but we just need to remember, and I come from education, to me, taking a little effort and educating yourself every time you stumble across a big argument is not a bad thing. We are never too old to learn. Just because children go to school doesn't mean we can't go to school. So just take the effort to be informed, and I think our kind of group is really going in that direction in a strong way. And that's amazing. So be educated. Sometimes it helps to have a scientist in the room <laughs> while you're having these conversations. That's what we know at, at the environmental meeting on, on Wednesday night. It's like to have that information, some data, models, specifics, uh, it's just so crucial to having a, a conversation where you can, uh, can follow the complexity and the points. Or sometimes politicians are not the most efficient way to get that information or the next action in motion. Don? 
think there, there is a lot of big things being done. Uh, I mean, even in, like, say, the car industry with the electric cars, and especially in places like China, they're the biggest electric car producer. Yeah. And uh, there's been a lot of advances. The solar, the wind. Uh, one of my sons works in Halifax. He's a sustainable engineer. And so we get a lot of, I get a lot of feedback there. Uh, and they have this solar society. There's 4,000 members. And uh, these are everyday people who are building things and getting solar panels and heat pumps and the city of Halifax where he lives, they they're doing everything to their all their buildings, just making them sustainable. Right down to the all the leaf light bulbs and things. So there's there's big things being done and even as individuals, you know, we we can maybe think about, you know, solar wind heat pumps and those. But there's there is stuff you can do and that adds up. It, and it is it's happening a big impact. Uh, I know most of the new housing now in, in, in their area, there, pretty much there's encouragements to be able to get the solar panels and not have to pay, you pay them off. They pay off in their own efficiency, so they pay for themselves. And the numbers are just going up. And so I think there is a lot, a lot happening. I will say it's really cool to see people problem solve. When people are actually problem solving and doing something about it, it's it's like it's beautiful. Yes, I want to get back to, to your comment. Yeah, I'm, and I feel the same way pretty much everybody does. Um, and I have this like overwhelming sense of like futility, and which is not good. But um, I just remembered um, that King Helmet over in Woodstock has written a book about you know climate and um, there has been a group there um, of people in the town who have done demonstration projects and um, there's a community garden, a fairly large one in downtown Woodstock. Um, but I what I could do would be to have a conversation with Keith and just find out what's what the group has done and bring back. Take Holly and then the Jerry. Um, I feel like I want to acknowledge the full spectrum because it's fully true. And that is that my heart hurts when I recognize the deficit and the challenge that we're in. And it also has hope because there are some wonderful new ways of being and being with the earth meeting it where it's at amidst the change that's evolving. And um, I believe that we are so much a part of that. And in those moments where we feel helpless and we don't know, then for me, what I do is just try to meet that with as much love as I can for myself until I can allow that love to help me find the way forward that's new. And um, for me, of course, the eclipse is just so front and center. How do we as a community choose a way when we are doing this event that feels like it's a new way in honor of, of all the changes? And I still sit with that question, and I invite all of us to sit with that question. Um, as we navigate that, we do it the best that we can. And, um, and meanwhile, really try to, like John said, focus on there are new ways that are evolving. And put our attention how we're evolving together. Um, put our attention to how we are evolving together. Yeah, I'm watching the clock. So, Jody, why don't you take us out sure. of this portion of the discussion? Um, kind of pulling in everything that everybody's talking about. I have kind of been doing this for about 40 years. 
Um, there are plenty of ways that we can each individually make a difference every day. And even if it's just little things, whether it's your compost that you decide to do, whether you decide that you're going to do one vegan or vegetarian meal and, and pull down the, the gases that we use that way, there are tons of different things. Part of what we're doing with the uh, cafe here is that we're putting in some vegan options. We're starting to, to help with these things. Um, we were watching a show yesterday that was actually talking about in Arizona, and I have good friends that live uh, in Phoenix, and the reason they choose Phoenix is because there's still water. There are a lot of rural communities right now in our own United States that do not have water. Their wells are dry. Um, if you're not familiar with this, educate yourself. And once you have an idea, the biggest thing that, the biggest thing that you can have an impact with is writing. And not just your senators and your congressmen, yeah, those, those matter, but our people right here in town, the people who have control over what we do, because it's very disconcerting when they have all these wonderful solar and wind and all these things, and then you go to do it at your house and somebody shows up at the door and says, oh, that's great, but not here. And it all goes back, and I'll be very honest, to the amount of money that the electric companies, and we all know because we pay the bills, and here we're, we're very, we're sheltered here Holtons. in comparison in Holton. But you get to the outside surrounding areas and you start talking about your electric bills and your water bills. These are things that we need to address right at our local levels. And the fastest and most unbelievable impact you can have is to go to your people who are in charge here and say, we want it open so that we can put solar and we're not going to be taxed for it. And we don't want to have to tie into anybody else's system. We want to be able to do this without it pulling profit for other people. If it's going to be pulling profit, it should be going back into the nonprofit, like we have said here, so that it helps all of us. These are things that you can do on a daily basis. Take a look at what's going on in the world. Find out what your local people are doing. Why is it that you can't put a well in if you have this? Why can you not put wind or solar if you live in a certain area? and force them, because we, we do count, our voices matter, to change those laws so that everybody can do this and we can actually make a difference. The greed has to go and the community, as Helen was saying, the love has to come in. And we have total control over that every single day. <laughs> I appreciate the energy and enthusiasm in the room for this topic. Our conversation will continue into the upcoming weeks. I do want to finish up by a short quote uh, from Not Too Late, from uh, Rebecca Solness' essay uh, for today's reading. And she says that the climate crisis is an emergency. We need some very direct action and some very big change, and we need it fast. But if you look at all the small pieces, it does add up. Struggle is long and boundaries are important. Still a huge shift from where we were a decade ago in terms of broadly shared understandings and agendas, the improvement and implementation of renewable energy and electrification, the growth of the movement not just in scale but in its sophistication and intersectionality. The story is not finished and we do not know how it ends we can help decide that. Doing the work matters. Knowing how and why it matters. Why it's worth it. I mean including all the indirect consequences and bringing that along with us uh, as we do the work. As we do the hard work that lies ahead. extinguish the chalice, a closing benediction. To walk purposefully in the light, truth spreads steadily in the openness justice creates, and compassionately in the warmth <coughs> that love radiates. It shall advance us surely toward the good, and shall in the end 
make us responsibly present on the earth and fit companions for one another along the way. Let us continue into this new week with the optimism and creative spark that love brings. Thus closes today's service. We want to thank everybody for tuning in today. If you'd like to show your support, please uh, hit the like button, subscribe to our channel if you're not already subscribed, and sh help us out by sharing this message by clicking the share button. If you'd like to make a monetary donation to the UU Church Holton, there is a link to our online donations in the video description down below. And again, thank you so much, and have a blessed day.